All right. Good morning, everyone. Nice to see you today. Glad you're here. And uh, if you're joining us online, thank you so much for being with us. Big shout out to each of our locations, as well as those joining us in different prison facilities and our partnership with God Behind Bars. We're grateful for you. Let's put our hands together for them. Thankful to have you guys joining us today. Hey, uh, do you remember like the little white lies that you know our parents and family members would tell us to get us to make wiser choices when we were little kids? Things like uh, if you sit too close to the TV, it will ruin your eyes. Any of you hear this growing up? Like I, I heard this all the time. Which the funny thing is now we all have these devices, right, that are like literally six inches from our faces all the time. But, but that's what we grew up with. Uh, another one is uh, hey, if you pop your knuckles, you'll get arthritis. And not like when you're 90, like right now, you know, which I wish my wife would have believed that because she's always popping her knuckles and it drives me crazy. Um, another one was this. If you go number one in the public pool, the water will turn red. Any, any of you ever hear this? This is, this is, yeah, no, not very many. Okay, that's, that's not very encouraging for what's happening in the public pool then. You know what I'm saying? But, but if, it was that, if that was only true. The one that my grandma used that I believed wholeheartedly that marked me my whole childhood is she said, Judd, if you cross your eyes too long, they will get stuck that way and they'll be stuck that way the rest of your life. And so I believed her. I was terrified. I remember I never crossed my eyes again. I was always kind of trying to be careful about crossing my eyes because I was just afraid of what this was going to mean going forward into the future. And so I just want to take a moment right now. I want to show you, friends, this is what freedom looks like. Okay, are you ready? Here we go. Here we go. Can you even tell? Oh, yeah. Feels so good. From the time we're little kids, we get told little white lies that may be innocent enough. But then we get older and we start to believe bigger lies and things that take root in our hearts and in our lives that um, can have huge damage. Because when you start to believe a lie, then the danger is you start to live like you believe the lie. And it affects not only you, it affects your friends, your family members. It affects, in many ways, the leadership lid that you experience in your own life, how far you can go in many things in your own life. Our thoughts have tremendous power. And so last week, we kicked off this teaching series called Out of My Mind, because <laughs> a lot of us know what it feels like to be going out of our mind right now in this season. But our spin was this. We got to face the lies that we tell ourselves. We got to get some of these things out of our mind before we go out of our mind. And so last week we talked about the lie, I'm done. Sometimes it's it's easy to just feel like we're done, we're finished. And we talked about how we approach that lie, how we deal with that in our own life. And we said, even when you feel like you're done, God isn't done with you. This week, I want to talk about the lie, I'm on my own. I'm on my own. And I think right now in this season, it's tempting for us to maybe even believe that lie that we're just on our own. Maybe you feel like you're alone when it comes to your finances, or you feel like you're alone when it comes to work right now. You feel like you're alone when it comes to dealing with unemployment issues. You feel like you're alone when it comes to a relationship or a marriage. Some of you single parents just feel like you're on your own as it relates to your kids. Some of you feel like you're on your own as it relates to anxiety or depression in your life, and nobody knows sort of what it takes for you to get through the day, and you're just on your own. You can sit in a, in a, in a family room, around other people. You can sit in a church community around other people and you can still feel completely alone in that moment. I think we all know what it is to begin to buy into the lie that I'm on my own. We all struggle with it, but here's my encouragement to you today. God has not disappeared just because you're disappointed. God didn't leave just because things are hard. God hasn't abandoned you just because you feel lonely or alone right now in your life. Feelings are not facts. Feelings are feelings. 
And you may feel one way, but that doesn't make it true. So I want to talk to you today about how we can get that lie out of our minds and move forward in faith with what God has put in our lives. And to do it, I want to look at this amazing biblical story of Gideon in the Old Testament. Gideon's in the book of Judges. Judges is a book that kind of comes right after the Israelites finally get to the promised land. We looked at that in this series that we did called God in the Wild. And they get there and they're all settled. And, and they don't really have a king over them at this point. Um, and so what inevitably happens is God was supposed to be their king. God was to be their ruler. And they were to follow God and be faithful to God. But the Israelite people did what a lot of us do. They were blessed by God. God did a lot in their life. They had comfort. They had peace. And then they started to kind of go their own way. And so there's this cycle that you see that runs again and again throughout the book of Judges. And um, it's usually teed up by this phrase. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes, in their own eyes. So the Israelites start going their own way. They start to leave God behind. They worship other gods. They do, and then God removes his hand of protection. Another group comes in and conquers the Israelites. They get humbled. They're desperate. They cry out to God again. And what does God do? God would raise somebody up that would then lead the Israelites back into peace and prosperity and freedom. And that person that he would raise up was called a judge. That's what the book of Judges is. It's all these different judges that God raised up. And so this happens again and again and again. Then the Israelite people drift from God again. God removes his hand of protection. They're destroyed by another enemy. And then eventually they cry out to God and humble themselves. And then a new judge gets raised up. And that judge leads the Israelites in victory. So when we land in Judges chapter 6, we meet this judge named Gideon. And um, at the moment, Gideon is... Um, He's in a wine press, uh, this old stone wine press, and he's basically hiding out, trying to harvest grain, trying to put food on the table. And the, the, the challenge they have is the Midianites, for seven years, the surrounding people have come in and, and conquered the Israelites. They, they take their food, they raid, they take all of their crops, whatever they grow, they just come through and, and take what they want, right? So Gideon's hiding out, laying low, just trying to get food on the table. And the Bible says the angel of the Lord comes to him. It's kind of fascinating. The angel of the Lord, when he shows up in the Old Testament, sometimes it's like this supernatural, amazing thing, right? The angel of the Lord, and they know it immediately. And then sometimes it's like the Old Testament people aren't aren't always clear what's happening in, in, the, in the initial. And that's what, when you see Gideon, it's almost like he doesn't understand really who this person is initially that's talking to him. Angel of the Lord just shows up and says, mighty hero, the Lord is with you. Which is kind of funny because right now Gideon's hiding out in a wine press, <laughs> not very mighty and not very heroic trying to get food just to put on the table, afraid that if he did it out in public, the marauders and raiders would see him and they would steal it for themselves. But God still shows up and says, mighty hero, the Lord is with you. And Gideon kind of pushes back on this. Check this out. Judges chapter 6, beginning of verse 13. When we get to the highlighted red word here, let's all say it out loud together. But, but here's what Gideon says. Sir, Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? You ever felt like that in your life? I mean, come on, if God is really with us, why are we facing the coronavirus? If God is really with us, why did I get furloughed or laid off at work? If God is really with us, why do I feel like right now I got more mess than miracle in my life? I got more burden than blessing in my life. Why are things so hard right now? If God is really with us, then why is all this happening? And the next sentence, and where are all the miracles our ancestors told us about? You ever felt that way? Like you're, like you're like reading the Bible and you see Jesus do all these miracles and you're like, man, that's amazing. You know, raise the dead, make the lame walk, make the blind see. That's awesome. God, I'm just praying for, you know, a small, just a little miracle, not even a big one, not even significant, just a small one. Gideon says, where, you know, where are the miracles? And didn't they say the Lord brought us up out of Egypt but now the Lord has what? Abandoned us and handed us over to the Midianites. What's Gideon saying? I'm on my own. I'm on my own. And I think a lot of us know what it is to feel like we're on our own. It's okay to ask these questions. God, why is all this happening to us? It's okay to wrestle with where are the miracles, you know, that I read about in the Bible when I'm just holding on for a miracle in my own life. 
It's okay to navigate the feeling or the sense that we've been abandoned. But what God is going to encourage Gideon with can be a huge encouragement to us in our lives today. And that is that God is with us no matter how we feel, no matter what we're facing, no matter what we're going through in our lives. So how do we kind of deal with the lie? I'm on my own. First thing that we can do is reclaim our calling. Reclaim your calling in your life because you have a calling. God has a purpose for you. He has a plan for you. He's created you in his image. He loves you. He's brought you this far. Listen, come on somebody. He's brought you this far. He will take you the rest of the way. He didn't bring you this far to just leave you, you know. He didn't bring you this far to just abandon you. God's going to see you through. Now by every estimation, 2020 has been a brutal year so far and it's, we're, you know, not close to over. I saw this uh, picture of uh, babies born in the year 2020 and just check out some of these little babies. Can you see, look at that, look at that baby. He's like, dude, what have you done to me? Right, you know, and then you got this guy over here who's just like, uh, I don't know, but my favorite is this little Winston Churchill looking baby right down here. You see that? Look at that face. It's just like, man, what is happening in the world I just got born into, right? This is what 2020 may have felt like so far. 2020 may mark us, but it doesn't have to destroy us. 2020 may be challenging, but it doesn't have to define us because God is still with us even in the midst of the problems and in the midst of the difficulties, in the midst of the challenges. He hasn't left us. He hasn't turned his back on us. He hasn't abandoned us. Look, you may feel like you're on your own, but that's just a feeling. Your faith tells you that God is with you even in the trouble even in the difficulty, even in the situation. And you got to lean into your faith in that moment. You got to remember your calling. I mean, the angel of the Lord comes to Gideon and says, mighty hero, the Lord is with you. And here's Gideon hiding out, <laughs> laying low, not acting very heroic. God sees him not as he is, don't miss this, but as he created him to one day be. He sees not his past, he sees the potential that he can have through faith in him. When God looks at you, and I believe God looks at some of you today, and what he wants to say to you is a similar message, mighty hero. You say, I don't, I don't feel very heroic, I barely got out of bed this morning. <laughs> mighty hero, I don't know, I've been doing too much Netflix time, y'all. Not very heroic. Mighty hero. You're a mighty hero because the Lord is with you. And it's not about you. It's not about your past. It's about your potential in God. Listen, your potential is determined by, uh, it, it is not determined by the problems you face, but by the God that you serve. God is with you and working in you. And because of that, he can call out what he's put in you. He says, mighty hero, the Lord is with you. And then check this out. Judges chapter 6, verse 14. Gideon kind of comes back and... Um, and then this is what it says. Then the Lord turned to him and said, go with the what? Strength that you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I am sending you. Go with the strength that you have. Now, if you read that, some of you are like, that's not very encouraging. Like, I don't have a lot of strength right now. You know, that's why I'm in church. You know, I don't have a lot of strength right now. That's why I'm trying to lean into God. I need more strength. You know what I'm saying? Like, go with the strength that I have. But there's this interesting dynamic. You see it come out in the Bible again and again, which is God often calls his people to go with the strength they have, and then he meets them along the way with the strength that they need. He rarely gives you the strength you need before you go with the strength you have. You know, somebody's waiting around like, I don't know, God, man, if you gave me the strength, then I'd get out and do it. If you gave me the strength, then I would take that step of faith. If you gave me the, and I think God's saying, no, you go with the strength you have, and I'll give you the strength you need in the moment when you need it. And so here's Gideon. He's like, hey, man, I'm just out here trying to put food on the table. God's like, you're going to, God often raises up the most unlikely people. And the, the angel of the Lord says, you're going to free, you're going to be the next judge. You're going you're gonna to rise up and be the one who will free my people. Go with the strength that you have. God's calling in our lives comes with a filling. And he will fill us in the moment. In fact, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning in verse 9, this is the Apostle Paul in the New Testament. He says, my grace is all you need. 
My power works best in what? In weakness. And, you know, I used to read this, and I used to think, man, that's cool. So God's power is going to work best in my weakness. So when I'm weak, God's going to make me strong, and I'm going to feel strong, and I'm going to be strong, and I'll be like Superman, like the rock. Ah. But there's another way of kind of reading this, which is God's grace is what I need. My power works best in weakness. I may continue to feel weak. In fact, my feelings may not change at all, and yet God's strength is what sees me through in the moment. In other words, God's power doesn't take away the experience of feeling weak. God's power helps me get through it even though I feel weak. Listen, the very thing that makes you feel weak can become a doorway to God's strength in your life. He sees you through that season. It's how God works. It's what he does in our lives. And so for many of us, we just got to go back to our calling right now. We got to remember kind of who God is and and what he's done and how he's moved and how he's worked. Listen, he's called you to a better future. He's called you to a friendship. He's called you to um, a greater life. He's called you to be an overcomer in a world that is overwhelmed. Right? He's called you to be a forgiver in a world that condemns. He's called you to be a light in dark times. He's called you to be his representative. He's called you to a living hope in your life. He's called you to a spirit of boldness. He's called you to a life of gentleness. He's called you to share his good news. He's called you to experience his joy. He's called you to be his witness. He's called you to to make his name great. He's called you to live as an outpost of his love. Listen, he has called you to be a blessing in a world that is buried in burdens right now. He's called you to stand up for those who can't stand up for themselves. He's called you to care for those who've been forgotten. He's called you to be an example of his overwhelming grace. He has called you to be an object of his compassion. And he's called you to a life that gets better as you follow him in faith. And until that day comes when he dries every tear from our eyes, right? Until that day comes, he's called you to be filled with his strength and power even in the midst of your weakness. You have a calling. And some of us right now, we feel so alone, and I get it, and we've been through so much, and we just feel like we're on our own, but we got to remember God is always with us, and not only is he with us, there is a calling on our lives, there is a mandate on our lives, there is a mission on our lives, and it is bigger than the coronavirus, friends. It is bigger than this year and this month and what happens in our life and our family. It's about God's name and his fame, and his name will live forever. God isn't finished. We said it last week. You're not done. This isn't the final, you know, of the final page of the book. This is just a chapter as you're moving along. And someday we'll look back on it and maybe we'll understand it differently. But God has not disappeared just because you're disappointed. Reclaim your calling. Remember who you are and then remember who is with you. Remember who is with you. Years ago, I remember I was standing in the lobby at our Henderson location and, um, there was a man that had, had, had walked in, and he had never been to our church before. Uh, he wasn't mentally stable, and especially in that moment, he, he just showed up, and he had an agenda. He was angry, and he wanted to stir up trouble. The guy was looking for a fight, literally. So I, I see him kind of irate in the lobby, so I walked up to him and start having a conversation with him. And this guy's yelling, he's, he's cussing, he's literally like one inch from my face, his, his hands are balled up in fists, and I'm thinking at any moment, he is gonna just lay, just go after me, right? Like, it's this is about to go down. And I'll be honest with you, what I remember thinking in the moment is, Judd, if he hits you, you cannot hit him back. You cannot hit him back in the lobby of the church that you pastor. Because y'all know, man, I haven't always been on this side of the road. You know what I'm saying? Like, so I remember like just, you know, just stay calm, just stay calm. Whatever happens, you can't do not strike back. Don't, don't, don't flip that switch, you know. And uh, this guy, we just went on and on and on. I just kept smiling, just tried to stay calm, try to diffuse the situation. And I remember finally I got him to calm down enough. And by the grace of God, he turned around and he left. And um, I'm standing there. I remember I looked down and my hand was totally shaking. I mean, it really shook me up this moment. 
And I turned around, and what surprised me, what I just hadn't really thought about in the moment, because I was just right here with this person, is that um, three of my friends had sort of positioned themselves real, real casually around me. One of them was an off-duty police officer. One of them was an off-duty police officer who was a member of the SWAT team. And one of them was like this biker dude that you do not want to meet in the alley at night if he's upset. And they were all like super chill, man. They're all just like leaning, just like positioned about six feet from me in every direction. And I turned around and I'm sort of shaking and all these guys just did was they all just sort of nodded at me. And uh, one of them said, hey, we got your back. Another guy said, if that guy would have taken a swing at you, it would have been the last thing he did. You know, and I'm just standing there and it was a moment for me to realize where I thought I was alone, there was a whole group of people that had my back that saw from a distance, we got, we got a friend in trouble and just came around to be there. Some of you right now, you feel like you're, you're alone. You're, you're facing issues and situations in your life right now that cause you to feel like you're on your own. But I wanna encourage you today that we, the people of Central, your church family, we have your back. Whether you can see us there or not, we're there. We're praying for you, we'll walk with you, we'll help you however we can. You are not on your own. Don't believe the lie that you're on your own when you got a whole community of people that are standing behind you, right? That are there if you need them. That's what the church is supposed to be. That's what we do for one another, right? And it doesn't have to be a Official and from the one of the things I love is how our church family takes care of each other without permission. <laughs> we don't ask permission; we just ask forgiveness. You know, like so somebody needs hurt, somebody needs help, we help them, right? You know, somebody goes without, we slip them some money. Somebody doesn't have food, we get groceries, we take it to their house. We don't need a commercial run on that. That doesn't have to be a life story video. Nobody has to know about that. That's just God working, and He does it every day through thousands of people in their lives. We take care of each other. That's what we do. And how much more does God have our back in those moments when we feel all alone? Now look at this, Judges chapter six, beginning of verse 15. Here's what Gideon says. But Lord, Gideon replied, how can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest of the whole tribe of Manasseh. You ever felt that, like, you know who I am? I'm the weakest of the whole tribe of Manasseh and I am the least in my entire family. Any of you, any of you, like, I'm the last kid in my family. I'm the last of four kids. Any babies of the family in the room, the babies of the family? You know, like, if you're a firstborn in the family, there's pictures of you, there's video of you. Like, when you were born, it was a huge deal. It's like, no, we've got a baby, our first child. When you're the last kid of four, there's like two pictures of me from my entire childhood, you know? It's like, parents are over it, you know? It's like, anyway, we got three other kids to deal with, Right? Some of you know that feeling in your own family. Whether you were born first or last, you're like, man, I, I don't know, God. I, I, I don't have it in me to do what you're calling me to do. I'm the last. I'm the least. I, I'm insignificant. I don't matter. I'm just trash. I'm a loser. Like, God, I, I, God, you can't use me in the way that you envision. But look at what God says to Gideon. He says, I'm, I'm the, our tribe is the weakest. I'm the least in my entire family. And the Lord said to him, look at this, I will be be, help me, with you. I will be with you. I will be with you. Turn to the person next to you to say, I will be with you. Listen, this is huge because when it comes to God and his mandate on your life and mine, it is not about you or me. It is not about our background. It is not about our past. It's not about our mistakes or our failures or how much we watched Netflix last week. Listen, what it is fundamentally about is the presence of God. You see that? What he says, what's the answer for Gideon? I'm the least, I'm the last, I can't do it. You know, God says, it's not, I'll be with you. It's like, shut up, son, I will be with you. And that changes everything, right? In fact, Gideon had kind of gotten into a mindset that I think a lot of us can be tempted to get into, and uh, I just sort of put it this way, that we start to think the presence of problems equals the absence of God, which then equals I'm on my own. 
Right? Because of our problems, we look at all the things going on in our life. Some of you, you're not sleeping well at night right now. All you see are your problems and they're overwhelming and it's caused you to feel like God has abandoned you or disappeared in your life. Elvis not only left the building, God left the building, you know, like and you're not sure what to do with that and it makes you feel like you're on your own. But there's another way to look at this and I bring this up here. Instead of starting with the presence of our problems, you start with the presence of God. Some of you, when you get up in the morning and you've been spinning around all night long thinking about all of your problems and your problems seem all consuming. I want you to remember this. Where you start has everything to do with where you finish. So if you start with your problems, you can end with I'm on my own. But when you start with the presence of God, then you realize he gives you the strength to face your problems and then you realize I'm never alone. I'm never alone. I'm never alone because God is with me in the midst of it all. When our kids were little, I remember how hard it was to put them to bed. Some of you remember this in your life, some of you are living this right now, some of you are gonna have no idea what I'm talking about, but your day is coming. But I remember, you know, it was so hard to put them to bed at night. And, and uh, you know, my little son, Ethan, he never wanted to go to sleep. We'd have to sit outside of his door for like an hour, two hours to get him to go to sleep. And uh, we'd have to rotate turns every other night, you know, for who did it. It was like such a glorious little thing when it wasn't my turn to sit out in front of the door and put Ethan to bed at night. Um, my daughter, Emma, she went to bed really easy, but she would wake up different random times. I remember once in the middle of the night, she just wakes up screaming, just, ah, ah, and, and you know, I woke up like immediately because you have that sort of parental thing now in you, and you just, you hear things with like superhuman power that you never heard before, you know, and I run into the room, and I turn the light on. It's middle of the night, kind of or two in the morning kind of thing. I hit the light and there's my daughter and she's, she's sitting, laying in bed with her finger just like this in front of her face and no lie. When she looks at her finger and the light comes on, she goes, bugger, bugger, get it off me, get it off me. She's like paralyzed. I'm like, really? You woke me up in the middle of the night because you got a booger on your face. Now if it was my son, he'd just eat that thing and go right back to sleep, right? Come on, boys. Boys be like, that's no problem. Girls, that's a whole other thing. But I remember with my kids, those moments when they would wake up, not long after we put them to bed, and Lori and I would be in the living room, but we hadn't gone back to bed yet, and they would get up pretty soon, and they wouldn't know what time it was. They, they hadn't been asleep that long, but they didn't know like how long they had been asleep. And they just expected to walk into our room and find us there, and they would walk into the bedroom, and mom and dad aren't there, you know, like they're not in the room. And I remember those moments when they were really young, when they would have a total meltdown. Come on, parents, you remember this? Like fear, tears, shaking, trembling, because it's like, mom, dad, they're gone. They're gone, and I'm alone, and they're scared. And I remember going in and sweeping my daughter up and just telling her, look, Emma, I'll, I'll always be here for you. You don't ever have to be afraid. I'm, just because you may not see me right here in this moment, I'm here. I got you. I'm your dad. I love you. No matter what happens, I'll be with you. And I think how much more does God want to relay that message to us in this season? For some of you right now, it's dark. And the lights are off and it's scary. And it feels like a bad dream. You're not sure, like, Am I awake? Am I dreaming? And you wonder where God is in all of it and what he's doing in all of it. And I think he wants to tell you what he told Gideon. I will be with you. I will be with you. Look, just because, you know, you're, you're disappointed, you're frustrated, you're hurt, that doesn't mean God has disappeared. He's still present. He's still moving. And he has your back. And so... Some of you right now in your life, you may feel like you're just too weak. You're too weak for what you're facing. You're too weak for what you're up against. Uh, you're too weak for what's coming at you. Morally, spiritually, physically, God says, I'll be with you. Some of you right now, you say, God, I have no skills or, or talents. I'm, I'm totally unqualified. God says, I'll be with you. Somebody says, God, I'm not smart. I never did well in school. I never met a test I couldn't bomb. Come on, somebody. 
But God says, I will be with you. Somebody says today, I'm, I'm not bold. I'm not brave. I'm an introvert. I make everything awkward. God says, I will be with you. Somebody says, I'm totally overwhelmed. I'm tired. God says, I'll be with you. Somebody says, God, I don't know if I can handle it. God says, I will be with you. It's the answer. It's the presence in the midst of our problems. It doesn't make the problem go away. It gives us the strength to face the problems. It doesn't even always make us feel strong. It gives us the strength to go forward with what we have, and God meets us along the way. Somebody says, listen, what if I make a huge mistake? God says, I'll be with you. What if I can't get back all that I've lost? God says, I'll be with you. What if no one helps me? God says, I'll be with you. What if I end up alone? I'll be with you. What if I'm rejected? I'll be with you. What if I let everyone down? I'll be with you. What if everyone lets me down? I'll be with you. What if the weight becomes too much to bear? I'll be with you. What if I'm too tired to move on? I'll be with you. And if God is with you, it doesn't matter who is against you. Because where the Spirit of Lord is, the Spirit of the Lord is, listen, there is victory. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is joy. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is peace. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So I get it. I get it. It's easy right now to think I'm on my own, but it's a lie. You're never alone. And God is with you. And the fact that he is with you, you can live as the mighty hero he created you to be. You can live in your calling, your purpose, your future, and you can redeem it today. Reclaim your calling. Remember who is with you and flush that lie out of your mind that you're on your own. Maybe some of you, you're here today and maybe you're at a place in your life where God has been tapping you on the shoulder, where he's been calling you to come home to him. And if that's where you're at today, I would love to lead you in a simple prayer to just surrender your life to Jesus Christ and to begin that spiritual journey with God. So would all of you bow your heads and close your eyes? If you'd like to become a follower of Jesus today, you can begin that journey by repeating this prayer after me to say, dear God, I thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Jesus into the world. I believe he died on the cross for my sins. I believe he rose again. Forgive me for my sins. Give me the gift of eternal life. Help me face the challenges that I'm up against. God, I surrender my life to you. In Christ's name. Friends, with every head bowed and every eye closed, if that's your prayer today, if it's your commitment, I want to ask you to just slip your hand in the air, wherever you're at. Just make eye contact with me if you're here in the room. Just slip your hand in the air. God bless you guys. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Just reach out to him today. Thank you. God, we thank you for your love. I thank you for each person just trusting you, reaching out to you today. And I pray you'll fill their life with your goodness, your purpose, your joy, your forgiveness, your grace. Thanks for the privilege of knowing you, of coming together and worshiping today. We ask all these things in Christ's name, amen.